Allen. Uh, our next speaker is trying to revolutionize our energy storage. She's co-founder and chief scientist of LightSail Energy. Her fascination with energy is long-standing. About 10 years ago, she was 17 years old, and she was focused on nuclear fusion. So she started a PhD program at uh, Princeton's Plasma Physics Lab. But she soon realized, as she says, that fusion, if anything, is the power source of the far future. And it is the near future she worries about. So Danielle Fong is here to talk about that urgency she feels. She'll share some th thoughts, and then she'll talk to Mary Louise Kelly. Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I should say I'm honored uh, that you are willing to spend your afternoon, uh, it's a sunny day in California, uh, with us. Um, and so I should reward that with clarity. I am a millennial. No shades of gray, definitely a millennial. Um, and let's see, okay, yes, it actually works. I should state our mission. Now I can't speak for all millennials, but on behalf of those whom I can speak, our mission is to provide abundant, sustainable energy for everyone. And just unpacking that a bit, abundant means inexpensive and reliable. So not just when the sun shines, um, or the wind blows. Uh, sustainable means green, but also there's enough of it. You're not going to run out of some mineral. And for everyone, it means we can't just focus on this generation in this nation. We've got to pay attention to the billions of people that are coming into uh, the world and uh, a new economy where they want the energy services that we have. And usually a lot more air conditioning because they're in very hot climates. Um, so luckily, we are not the only people with this, uh, with this mission. The world has changed. And uh, this graph really shows it. The price of solar power has dropped meteorically. Uh, this is actually from a, a presentation. They call this graph the Terror Dome. I, I don't know why, but I, I think in the audience there were a lot of people from the conventional fossil fuels industry. And as you can see, the price of fossil fuels kind of bumps around for a while, and the price of solar just descends just incredibly rapidly. I, I don't know why it isn't quite lining up there, but th this here is the price of solar power. And you only have to project that out a few more years before it is by far the cheapest source of energy anywhere. Um, and this graph here uh, is also good news. The Earth's populated regions are all hit by sunlight pretty well. Um, so one way to read this chart is that a roof in Seattle sees more than half of the solar that a, a, the Nevada desert sees. Um, this is actually really good news, uh, especially for decentralized production of energy uh, from solar power. Um, it is inevitable. But there's a problem. Uh, it's kind of obvious. Um, solar power is only available during the day. Sometimes there are clouds. You need some way to store the energy that is economical and scalable. Um, so this is the formula that you've got to solve. And if you can make this true, if the cost of off-peak energy plus the cost of energy storage is cheaper than the cost of conventional sources of power on demand during the, the most high demand parts of the day, plus the cost of the grid upgrades, the wires and the transformers that are needed to transport the power from the power plants to where people want it, then you enable a world where the most economical way to provide power is also sustainable. Um, and that's what we're trying to work on. So there are kind of two really prominent ways to store energy. One's electrochemical, and one's thermomechanical. And the examples here are batteries. This is from uh, the Tesla Model S. This is the battery pack that they've got. And thermomechanical, these are engines. This is the world's dominant power system. There are so many engines that um, if you added them all up and turned it into a power plant, it would be 100 times larger than all of the other power plants in the world combined. Um, and the same batteries that are in a Tesla are basically cell phone batteries. So you're all pretty familiar with these. Um, and engines, I'm oh, sorry, I'm clicking forward and it's kind of not working. So if you compare the two technologies at a basic level, uh, with electrochemistry, you have a uh, chemical that you're reacting, and the ions are moving, it changes the voltage, uh, and then it dissolves and replates and dissolves and replates, and it degrades. Everyone is familiar with this if you've used a cell phone in the past 10 years. Uh, this is after only about 300 cycles. The lithium metal, which ends up flat, grows all of these funny things that increases resistance and reduces the amount of capacity that you have. They only last a few years. Whereas engines, hopefully, okay, the animation doesn't really work, but 
<laughs> engines, um, engines last for a very long time. Engines last, can last for decades, and they're incredibly cheap. Uh, to give you an example, power plants are sold at about $2,000 per kilowatt. Engines can be manufactured at about $10 per kilowatt. That is a factor of 200. Now, an engine with a crankshaft, pistons, valves, um, an engine block is extremely similar to an air compressor. It has all the same things. It actually compresses and expands air. And what we're doing is we're doing air energy storage using the same technology and manufacturing base to hopefully make it something that lasts a lot longer and is a lot cheaper than batteries to store energy. Um, so there are a huge number of advantages, long lifetime, low cost, scalability. Um, where people have struggled is in efficiency. And basically what happens is when you compress air, it heats up. Um, if any of you have pumped up a bicycle tire recently, you may recall that the bicycle pump gets quite hot. Well, just imagine that times 100. That's the process that occurs inside air compression if you compress it up to scuba tank pressures, 200 atmospheres, the pressure that we use. And what happens with hot air is it wants to expand. It fights you. And what you want is for the air to be as cold as possible during compression and as warm as possible during expansion. And so what we do is we spray water in during the compression process. This is our advance. Now, a lot of people thought that this would cause the compressor to break or it wouldn't transfer heat fast enough. Um, let me go through the process pretty quick, and then I'll show you a video showing that the compressor, in fact, does not break. Um, hopefully, the video won't break also. Um, so we uh, take air in. We start compressing it. Um, we spray water directly into the compressor. Um, the air goes in an air storage tank, which we also make um, really cheap carbon fiber. The heat is stored in a separate insulated heat tank. Um, and then during expansion, we spray warm water back. Um, and this process is reversible. So after you store the air, the whole process runs in reverse with the same, the compressor becomes an expander, the electric motor becomes a generator, and you get electricity when you want it. Um, so here's a video, and it works, uh, our machine and the video. Um, and uh, yeah, I clipped it a little bit, but it's gonna keep going for a bit. Okay, all right. So um, this is too small for you to actually see, but if you were up close, Basically, what you are seeing is a stack up of all of the different costs associated with providing energies. So you've got peak retail electricity there. You're paying a lot for the fuel, and they're not too efficient uh, sources of, of retail electricity. Batteries don't cut it to provide power, um, even at Tesla Gigafactory prices, because of the degradation and the fact you can't use the full depth of discharge and the ultimate cost. It won't be cheaper than peak retail electricity, but with our air storage system, uh, and then even further with our V2, uh, the cost will be far lower than peak retail electricity according to our projections. Now, we're not 100% there yet, but we see a clear path to getting here. Um, and so why does this represent the challenge of our generation? Um, to my mind, it really isn't because millennials are a greener, more environmental, generation than any other. It's because we have to solve this problem within our generation. Um, there's a, a basic truth about how carbon dioxide interacts with the environment. Um, it goes up, and it takes a very long time for it to be drawn down by uh, the different processes uh, out of the atmosphere. And it just, once it goes up there, it, it, it stays up there, and it keeps heating. And that basically allows you to produce a carbon budget. If you exceed that carbon budget, then you start to hit an inflection point at about uh, 800 gigatons in excess of what we admitted pre-industrially. Um, and that exceeds 2 degrees centigrade temperature increase, which starts causing a cascade of really bad environmental effects. If you take a look at this budget, and then you take a look at how much carbon we are emitting, you end up with a, a time frame of 17 years to stop. <laughs> you have to invent the technology that you're going to then scale to terawatts of power within 17 years. Um, so this is really a problem for this generation to solve. Uh, and the next generation will live with the consequences, but this war is ours to win or lose, and we've got to get moving. 
So, uh, so with that, I will join my host. Um, Here, come have a seat next to me. Thank you. Why don't you grab oh, sure. that one? I'll sit down next to you. And I am curious, Danielle, would you walk us back to that moment? Was it an aha moment when you were sitting thinking about this problem of, okay, I have solar energy, we need to figure out how to store it. The answer is air. Where, <laughs> where were you when, it, when, when you came up with this? Um, well, so it, it's funny. There, there are a series of aha moments, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you never, you're never really sure. You say, hey, "What about this? Is is that? You know, that seems interesting." So, I've always been interested in energy. When it came time to decide what I would work on, uh, that was the most important problem that I felt I could personally contribute to. Um, and in the nuclear fusion program when speaking with people about the progress that was being made in solar and wind, uh, people would always say, well, yes, but they don't know how to store it, and so, so therefore we need nuclear fusion. And I just assumed, I just thought, you know, nuclear fusion or energy storage, actually they don't seem of comparable difficulty. Um, so that was in the back of my mind. And then uh, I heard people complaining about the degradation of batteries, which made sense to me, knowing how they worked. Um, and I thought, okay, well, what about compressed air? That seems cheap. Uh, and then and everybody, it, right? Okay, so you're, you're not, not going to run out of air, but all <coughs> the other components, the components to make electric motors, the components to make compressors, steel, you're also not going to run out of those. So then I asked myself, okay, well, why aren't people doing this? And people said, well, it's inefficient, it's flatly. I'm like, well, why is it inefficient? It's not obvious where the inefficiency was. And then a little further thought. Uh, pointed at the source of inefficiency, which was almost all concentrated in this one area. When you compress the air, it heats up. And then I said, OK, well, what if I figure out how to handle that? And first, there were a few different ideas. And they had some drawbacks. They required much larger systems. They were slower. Um, and then I, I read a, a book from more than 100 years ago. It was published. It was like reprinted by Amazon's partner. We got it. And it discussed how they did heat exchange by spraying water into the air. Um, not to compress it more efficiently, but actually to get water out of the air. Um, and I said, well, why the heck would they do that? You're spraying water into the air to, to pull water vapor out of it. And, and basically, what they're trying to do is precipitate it. They, they cool it. Um, so it's this really good heat exchange mechanism. And then I said, OK, well, if it's a really good heat exchange mechanism, why not put that into the compressor? Um, so you're describing there's there's no light bulb moment. There's well, there, a there are like a series of error, things that are like, going. hey, that's interesting, and it's a, it's a pathway. It's like a winding forest, you know, mountain path. And we should um, note that yeah. as you're as you're making your way down this winding forest mountain path, you were in your late teens, early twenties. You were you were yeah. well. Let me ask you the question: No woman should ever ask another woman on stage. How old are you? I'm 27. I'm gonna own that. You're gonna I am own 27. It. Um, I never thought I'd be 27. And you found it. <laughs> we'll all pause while the rest of us feel very old for a moment, and then we'll move on. Um, you were 20 when you founded Light So. Yeah. Um, Do people you, take you I seriously? Guess you can call. Well, uh, yes. yes. Yes, they did. Why? My, my co founder took okay. me seriously. Okay. Uh, he, uh, Steve Crane, and then later Ed Berlin, um, who are, are brilliant. Steve's a physicist, Ed, Ed's an electrical engineer, polymath guy. They took me seriously. And I had a plan, which was if they were my co-founders, and Steve was my um, uh, CEO, it would, it would be like we had adult supervision built in. <laughs> So, so therefore, venture capitalists would not think, well, you know, that sounds great, but oh, what a headache. I need to find a CEO, and actually. But, but they, they, my co-founders always treated me as a peer. Um, and that was terrific. Um, and I don't know what I did to be so lucky, but that was you, really uh, great. You pitched yeah. Bill Gates fairly early uh, That's That's process. true, yeah. How did that um, go? Well, that was a very interesting saga. Um, so. Uh, so, so our first investor, Vinod Khosla, um, who's legendary and brilliant, um, he had 5% um, of his fund was Bill Gates' money. And Bill, through his foundation personally, 
found it both interesting and critical to uh, his plan to get people out of poverty um, to mm -hmm. work on better sources of energy. And uh, a few companies in the Coastal Ventures portfolio were given the opportunity to present at Bill Gates. Um, and so then commenced uh, dozens of iterations of the presentation that we would do. Um, practicing, practicing, practicing uh, before you Yeah, you know, at least slides. Right. Um, a friend of mine You had who, to get the video working. You don't want it to crash. Yeah, that's true. There was a lot. Yeah. There, was, there was, yeah, there was less surprise when our, our <laughs> animations worked um, when presenting to Bill Gates. And um, a friend of mine, a designer, uh, actually, who uh, taught at RISD, helped out with the thing. And, and he, Bill Gates, really liked it, but here was the huge surprise to me. He had a binder full of all of our slides, and it was filled with like red, you know, red pen markings, oh, wow. and he'd uh -huh. study it, and he's like, all right, can you go to this slide? I had this question about the Carnot efficiency and all this stuff. Like, he was on it. I don't know exactly how he did it, but it, um, he's, he's very sharp. And then, uh, before he decided to invest in us, um, he had communicated to Nathan Mirvold who uh, studied physics also at Princeton. Um, he was his uh, chief technical officer and founder of Microsoft Research. And um, Nathan reached out. And they thought that there was a, a problem with what we were doing, uh, because there, they thought that uh, we were doing something somewhat different. Um, this is a problem with this imagined thing that we were doing. So I, I traveled up there, and, and he and Lowell Wood were, were doing the due diligence. And it was like uh, these very large, very brilliant sure of themselves men. And it took a while to actually figure out where the discrepancy was. But when I finally figured out how to um, turn it around and, and convince them of what we were doing and, and its validity, they said, oh, it's obvious. And then when I talked with Bill Gates the next time, he said, wow, you convinced Lowell Wood about something. That's amazing. And then Bill funded us. And then you took it from there. There yeah. you go. What is it? You're not there yet. I mean, this, this, That's, your idea for, for. Yeah, we have um, our system. You, you saw it working there. I mean, we're, we're testing it every day. Okay. Um, it, there's about um, two thirds of the system uh, currently functional. So right now, it's supposed to be a two stage system. Right now, it's just the high pressure stage. So the low pressure stage is in development. Okay. And then after that, we install it in our first field trials. Um, which will be next year, okay. uh, and then after that we scale commercially, okay. um, and then after that we have to scale the terawatts, which is um, that will be an epic struggle in of itself. When you allow yourself to dream of where light sail, where this technology could go, how big mm -hmm. do you dream? Well, I mean, the whole reason to do it is to make a difference uh, to the planetary energy system, which is very large, which is incredibly daunting. So you'd be crazy to think that it's a certain thing, but is the if first you think that you have a good shot. You power one talent off this, and then you see how that works? Is that, how do you, how do you measure? Well, it's like first one you know, medium-sized uh, commercial building, okay. one uh, wind farm or solar farm that you buffer, and then, and then it's 10, and then it's 100, and then it's really big ones, and then it's islands, and then it's... You know, and these are, to be clear, these are machines that would be on site at the building or at the building site. You're not trying to transport this across yeah, the building. Yeah, you're not, it doesn't actually make sense to like fill up an air tank and then ship that. Right. Um, but uh, the right way to think about it is it's like a, it's like a buffer, it's like a, a, a reservoir. And wherever there's a fluctuation in demand or supply, um, so for example, if you have a wind farm or a solar farm or if you have uh, you know, a residential building, or you know, a stadium, or an industrial building, where the, where the demand is fluctuating. You put energy storage there, and now you have to spend less on everything else, um, and, and you can store energy from renewable sources. Okay. So. I, I want to ask about one aspect of your experience, which maybe you know resonates with with everyone here, and it's how you you Danielle Fong learn. And I ask that because you know we've talked a little bit about just there's trial and error and there's various aha moments as you go, but you, one one aspect of your resume jumped out at me, which is you dropped out of junior high. <coughs> Margaret mentioned you you started at Princeton, and then you decided not for me and left that program. Is there something you know in traditional formal education that you find not the most useful way to, to accomplish your goals? Well, uh, so. Um, 
uh, I should be careful here, but I'll just say it. Uh, <laughs> tradi on. Traditional formal education is predicated on a bunch of myths, and they, they, they just don't track in the real world. Uh, I mean, so for example, what okay, so for example, um, hardly anybody remembers anything from school. Okay, like Show of they hands, don't. Who they don't remember much, anything? right? Like oh, there's yeah. like ten, less than ten percent. So, so for example, <laughs> I, I dropped out of middle school and I realized it's just not moving forward very quickly. And <laughs> it's, I, you know, everybody said like in elementary school, if you go to middle school, you know, things are going to be hardcore. I'm like, all right, middle school hardcore. And then uh, I showed up, and that was not true even slightly. And uh, I mean, the, the teachers were meaner, but they weren't <laughs> teaching more. And then uh, I just calculated, hmm, how many more years do I have of this? That's no good. There better be another way. I'm not going to school anymore. Um, well, how did I then, your parents take that, if I can just well, my how mom, do you just drop out of middle school? My mom also went to, she, for different reasons, but sh she went to college when she was 15. She learned that she could do that, and so therefore okay. it, it was less controversial than it would be in most families. So I'm very lucky there. Um, but uh, what I found was when I went to college, um, everybody was just teaching almost from the ground up anyway, because you couldn't count on people having remembered things from high school. <laughs> I, that was the truth. So I wasn't at a disadvantage at all. In fact, everybody else was spending a bunch of time being like, oh, I should know this, but I wasn't paying attention and beating themselves up, whereas I was just like, didn't have a complex about it. Um, <laughs> then there was uh, graduate school, same thing. Okay, the, the, they're all the new classes. You're like, okay, I know you took three classes in electricity and magnetism. Now you have to do another one because we can't count on people having remembered those things. And then after I started light sail, I started uh, doing a test for, for incoming people, uh, a theoretical test. And I would basically ask them to calculate the, the simplest non-trivial thing about how our system works. And I found to my dismay that people with PhDs 19 out of 20 of them could not do it. They mm. couldn't ca even, you know, more than half of them couldn't do an integral, which, you know, and these are these are quantitative disciplines. They must have done tens of thousands of them, and so therefore, I was just I was. So therefore, the formal education system isn't cutting it. So what I'm doing, maybe it's not that efficient, but it might be better than people having these gaps and then thinking that they shouldn't have those gaps and then just shying away from stuff. I know that every time I think about something new, it's going to be uh, an interesting new struggle. Even stuff I've already studied. So I'm curious about it. And I try to figure out, and I try to train my intuition until it makes sense, starting from basics, starting from first principles. I ask a lot of questions. And there are still so many questions that I have about things theoretically I should know because they've written a lot of nice things about me and I have a degree and it's first class honors and blah, 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 blah. And, and still, um, in quantum mechanics, there are a lot of questions. In statistical mechanics, there were fewer questions now because I work in the area, but there's still a lot. Everywhere it's like this, in economics, everywhere else. So if you keep yourself being open, you ask questions and you say, why not, why isn't it done this way? You end up pretty often at a frontier where people haven't explored. Right. I mean, this yeah. never, I mean, compressed air energy storage, I was never like, I'm going to be an industrialist and definitely compressed air is for me because that's in my blood and I have a family industry and air compressors. It's nothing like that. I just said, well, why don't they do this? And I kept asking questions until I found something that seemed to stand on its own. Well, on that note of asking questions, I know people out here will have some for you. Let me see. Um, we've got a couple of hands raised. Uh, let's take this right here in the front. Yeah. Hi, Danielle. I'm Crystal. Um, so Crystal? you mentioned abundant energy. Yes. And I recently had actually a couple of big debates with my friends about abundance, mm -hmm. mainly because um, the whole idea of abundance is great and dandy. But the problem is, from the beginning of Industrial Revolution to today, we have gotten ourselves to where we are when it comes to environmental catastrophe and global climate change is because people don't plan ahead. People do not think holistically. So with the idea of, of abundance, it feels like people, it would further encourage people to not think for the, about the consequences of what they do, 
because you're clouded with that idea. And mm -hmm. I w I'm curious to see what you think about that. How do you get people uh, to think about the consequences? Fine. So um, I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, I think that um, fundamentally we need to encourage people to think about these things. Um, but while they are unthinking and still demanding abundance, uh, or in particular, uh, I have another slide where I break that down. I mean, it has to be less expensive than current sources, and it has to be reliable um, and scalable enough to meet the demands of today and the anticipated demands of tomorrow. That, that's what I mean. Um, I think that we can be dramatically more efficient with the use of energy, a factor of 10. Um, but the issue is not whether we have enough of energy. The issue is whether or not we're taking care of the things that we care about, or that, that we should care about, um, the environment and uh, our people. And today that's not true. That's actually not true for both. Um, we neither take care of the environment enough, nor do we take care of uh, humanity enough. And with m more and cheaper and more reliable and more sustainable power, I think we can do both. But I think we have to be working on both of those fronts. One more question. We got one. One more. Uh, someone raised a hand before. So, oh, hello. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, I saw on your chart that you've got a big drop in capital costs for your V2. What, how? Can you tell us? It's not public yet. Um, I can leave you with an interesting hint. OK. She says, right. coyly. Um, one way to think about how we're storing power, storing energy, in uh, compressed air with the water spray is that we're storing both pressure and we're storing heat. And um, we can change those proportions. Sorry. <laughs> That's all I can get. My patent lawyer will go after me if I say more. Um, <laughs> if he offers to fund you, can you tell him more behind the scenes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that changes go. everything. <laughs> I'm a total whore. For <laughs> I had somebody send me a, a tweet. Need funding? I said, always. Hedge funder offering $20 million. We're following up. There we go. Yeah. Daniel Fong, thanks so okay, much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you.